Welcome, everybody. I will now introduce to you our keynote speaker of the day, Duncan Baker Brown. Duncan is a practicing architect, academic, and environmental activist, also the author of The Reused Atlas, a designer's guide towards circular economy. His work for more than 25 years revolves around the issues of sustainable development and the closed loop systems. He is the founder of Baker Brown, a research led architectural practice and consultancy. While working on diverse projects with numerous accolades, including the Reba National Awards and the Stephen Lawrence Prize for the Brighton Waste House, um, the money, the prize money was used to set up a student prize for cir circular closed loop design at the University of Brighton, where Duncan teaches. Um, <laughs> That'll do. <laughs> I was I was just going to give the last paragraph. Um, Duncan is one of the most high-profile architects, architect academics promoting the benefits of the closed-loop circular systems. He's also authored academic papers, curated exhibitions and symposia, and also hosts workshops in the UK, Europe, and sometimes abroad, further afield. Most recently, the ACAN Circular Economy lecture series with nine episodes um, with over 900 participants. Um, the role of the environment has um, the focus of the circular series and his work um, centers around the um, contribute, the architecture's role in contributing positively towards the existing challenges of the climate and ecological emergency. Welcome, Duncan. Thank you. That was splendid. You, you, you neglected to mention that I got a 10 meter sw swimming badge as well. But uh, <laughs> um, one thing I haven't done is just test that I can share my screen. So I just do that first. Um, just see if that's going to work. Oh, that's going to work. So if I just, just make sure you can see that. All good. Uh, I can see that. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining me. Um, it's uh, it's very busy time for pe people in, uh, interested in how the built environment can respond to the climate emergency. So that's good. Well, we've COP26 coming up and um, people blocking uh, junctions in uh, around the uh, M25. It's all happening. So um, this is I'm going to talk. It's a, a, a personal perspective. Um, and I'm talking about where I feel we are at the moment. As and when I say we, I'm talking about the construction industry uh, and humankind, really. But uh, this is aimed at a, an architectural audience. So um, I'll just uh, start from uh, the top, as it were. So um, there we go. There's the there's the front slide. Um, yeah. Um, obviously, um, we're still in and out of lockdown around the planet. We're in the middle of a pandemic. And from my point of view, um, that's all part of the climate and ecological emergency. Uh, it's one big emergency. That's, so that's why I entitled my talk, Design in the Age of Emergency. Um, and of course, what COVID is doing is really testing the built environment from you know, how useful or not it is now. Um, it really is uh, asking questions on how we occupy cities. Um, but we shouldn't forget that before the COVID pandemic, 2019 was the year that 90% of UK local authorities committed to being net zero carbon by 2030. That's sort of nine years away. And that's 60 million citizens existing in these places, 815 million people around the world live in similar states and regions that have declared this climate and ecological emergency. So uh, uh, for me, that's, that's good news. I know a, a lot of local authorities in the UK that are running around trying to work out how to respond to their politicians having this ridiculously ambitious 2030 target. I mean, our central government's target for 2050 is hard enough for us, I think it's going to be, but um, 2030 is uh, hugely ambitious. So, so what do we need to do? Well, what do we do next? For a, a lot of people, it's, it's this, unfortunately. It's, um, can we afford to save the planet or say it won't say it's not the planet that's got the problem it's humankind on the planet you okay and that is where we are i can't believe it but yeah you know, isn't it going to cost too much money to do the right thing um sorry my and yeah we just got to sort of build our way out of recession haven't we 
just get on with it. So what are the challenges to adopting an authentic, sustainable existence within our host planet? And why aren't more people with power concerned with their own business as usual policies, Boris? And are we all actually, to a greater or le lesser extent, climate emergency deniers? I like this cartoon as well. I love you, but I love fossil fuels more. It appears to be that. How can you work in the procurement of fossil fuels uh, at the moment and uh, have kids or grandkids? So why should we care in the construction sector? There's no vaccine for the climate and ecological emergency. There's no quick fix. But why us? Why, why the focus on the construction sector? Well, it's because it consumes around 50% of all the world's mined and harvested raw materials annually. And it's the environmental destruction associated with this process that is one of the main factors in generating the current mass extinction of species. We're nicking their stuff. And what's a bit scary is that in 2012, we extracted between 45 and 60 billion tonnes of raw materials every year. Up until 2018, eight years later, that had almost doubled to 100 billion tonnes. So the construction sector consumes half of that. So at the moment, 150 billion tonnes a year. In the UK, we consume 600 billion tonnes of products a year. And the UK generates about 200 billion tonnes of waste a year, with the construction sector contributing about 60% of that, which is 120 million tonnes worth of stuff. In addition, the construction industry uh, or co construction sector is about 45% of all carbon emissions. That's including the operation, maintenance, et cetera, uh, and, and demolition of buildings. So it's obvious humankind needs to learn how to manage planet Earth's resources. And so it's all about that. It's all about managing resources. And it's often designers, architects, and constructors who do this. We decide what our buildings are going to be made of, where that material comes from, and the negative or positive impact of those decisions. Unfortunately, at the moment, we exist as a linear economy. And I might not be the first person that's talked about that today. So a linear economy is where we take materials, we make them into things, we use them for moments, and we throw them away. We are literally the only system on this planet that works like that. Other, The, the rest of the natural world where it's balanced and healthy, uh, exist in a circular economy where there's no waste. Waste from one system is food for another. So the opportunities, obviously, for us to emulate the rest of the planet, other natural systems and ecosystems, and go from linear systems to circular ones. And with humans involved, you have to have two circles. The biosphere, which is organic stuff, which is harvested, um, and um, manufactured into things that are used, reused, constructed, deconstructed. And ultimately, if you haven't added toxins to them, they become uh, food, compost for new things to grow. That's lovely. But unfortunately, we like mobile phones, cars, and things that don't compost. So those are the things we've got to design for deconstruction and for perpetual, for perpetual reuse. And that. When we get it right, it will be mainly deconstruction and reuse, but at the moment it's mainly recycling uh, when we do it right. Um, you can't, I don't know if you can see me while I'm talking, but I've got a fair phone. And the, and the thing about a fair phone is that it's a smartphone that comes with a screwdriver. It's a totally different mentality to uh, iPhone and other companies who deliberately make their technology inaccessible. With a fair phone, if the camera uh, breaks, you can send the camera back to fair phone and they'll replace, and you can unscrew it yourself and then replace it with a new one. So this idea of uh, cradle to cradle, a circular economy comes from this book, Cradle to Cradle, uh, by um, uh, Bill McDonough and, and um, um, Professor Braungart, and Michael Braungart. And the interesting thing about this book is that it's written by uh, Greenpeace's uh, chemist, which is uh, Michael Braungart and an architect. And the subtitle is particularly interesting, Reinventing the Way We Make Things. So within the book, there's basically a message, which is don't do less bad, do good. So what's the point in burning fossil fuels 20% less? We just need to be not burning fossil fuels at all. 
Some good news. There's loads going on. It's a transformative time, uh, not, not just because of the pandemic. It was happening before. So the last two or three years have been really exciting from the point of view of people engaging with what I think are the real issues of the climate and ecological emergency. And one thing, these are just a couple of um, tweets that I grabbed um, around uh, the extent of renewables in the national grid in the UK at the moment. So the, the national grid, the energy supply for the country is cleaning up big time. And quite often wind and solar power are the number one energy source. And quite often, coal-fired power stations are turned off, which happened for the first time a couple of years ago. Um, basically, we stopped burning coal as our main uh, energy source for the first time in 250 years. Also, the big fossil fuel procurers are divesting. Not as much as they should be, but they are divesting. And who would inv invest in them now? Well, our government does, but apart from our government and other governments. So... This idea of resource management, i.e. consuming lots less of, in the way of materials, uh, and consuming less water, food, energy, whatever it is, is, is out there all the time. And uh, this is an article by Ollie Wainwright, The Case for Never Demolishing Another Building from, in the, from the Guardian. And there's loads of these. And there's campaigns for zero, zero VAT on net zero carbon retrofit. The Architects Journal has been doing that for the last couple of years. So that's because at the moment, when if you alter an existing residential building, you have to pay VAT at 20%. If you knock it down and do a new one, you don't have to pay any VAT. And why is that? Well, the mass house, house builders happen to be some of the largest donors to the Tory party and other parties. So you don't want to upset them, do you? So over 80% of today's built environment, sorry, my phone rang. Uh, over 80% of today's built environment will be with us in 2020. And that 2050, sorry, and that is when we need to be net zero carbon. And we have some of the leakiest property, leakiest property in Europe at the moment. So you may have seen this this week. Reuse is a big deal. Extinction Rebellion have taken it on as their latest campaign. And Insulate Britain is a very well informed campaign with a bit of direct action. And it's upsetting a lot of people, but it's also got a lot of people's attention. We've got a big job to do to insulate the existing housing stock and other building types so that they meet net zero targets. And it's a lump of money, but if you think about it as a national retrofit, and the, and the retrofit program is a national infrastructure project, as opposed to something like HS2, which is going to be, benefit a couple of people and give them an extra 20 minutes of uh, time because their journeys will be reduced by that much, which is not that useful and i'm focusing on hs2 being between london and birmingham not what it might do up north but if you think of retrofit of our housing it has to go across the whole of the country it's going to provide people with jobs money skills and by the way climate resilient nice homes low carbon homes so in a way what's not to like and we actually know what to do uh, some people already have a plan. Amsterdam is a donut city already. It's also zero, going to be zero waste by uh, 2030. Uh, Helsinki's had a plan for a number of years to be carbon neutral by 2035. Uh, London has, in its London plan, has now sanctioned the circular economy route map. And we've actually done one from for Brighton Hove City Council as well for the construction sector. So these, this, these are big, impactful things. There's the RIBA 2030 Climate Challenge and the wonderful uh, London Energy Transformation Initiative, their Climate Emergency Design Guide. They are bringing out more and more guides at the moment. They're about to do a retrofit uh, guide. Um, but there's a lot of discussion across industry now. So you've got this cross-industry action group initiative for a climate framework, defining what the issues are and how within the construction sector we can do this. And the one on the right is the sort of curriculum, uh, climate literate, uh, literate curriculum version of it as well. So these are people, these are clients, financiers, as well as structural engineers, services engineers, all account consultants and architects talking together and coming up with an agreed carbon descent plan. And this is what a lot of people are talking about. So I'm going back to the circular economy again. And within that, I, I did write this book a few years ago, 2017. I'm starting the second edition now. 
Um, and this was a reuse called the Reuse Atlas, a designer's guide towards the circular economy. And it was full of work uh, completed, delivered uh, case studies within these four what I called steps, starting with the most basic step, which is to recycle materials. And then the better thing is to reuse. So the difference between recycling and reuse is recycling is where you get a material, you melt it, shred it, mash it up, grind it, whatever. And that's okay, but you create waste, you consume energy, and often the material is not as useful as it was before. Reuse is a clever thing. So it literally is, you might have to pull something apart delicately and reassemble it, or it's instead of smashing up a glass, it's just cleaning a glass and, and, and getting a drink out of it. Reduce is where designers really have to kick in, architects and designers. Uh, Lacatan and Vassal famously um, had a, an, a, an urban square project to do, and they did the uh, prerequisite uh, analysis of the square, and their, their commission was to make it a better place. And they, they concluded that um, the park benches need to be repaired more often and the dog poo needed to be cleaned up. Nothing else needed to be done. So if you think they could have gone in there and think got a big commission and decided to sort of clear, fell everything and start again. So just, you know, the, the guts actually to say you don't need to do much here is a big, is a big deal. But also if you can't think about any of your projects, think about how to reduce the consumption of stuff to facilitate your project as much as possible. And step four is closed loop circular systems where there's no, there's no waste ever produced. So from this, you get terms in the circular economy like urban mining, searching for new material sources to reduce the need for natural raw materials. There's a pile of materials. It's actually the uh, conservation area in Brighton, but it's a pile of materials that have been there uh, from uh, 250 years ago to maybe 50 years ago. But you think of our cities as material stores for the future. And one of these uh, projects that did that, um, my first sort of urban mining project was the Brighton Waste House, which isn't a house, it's a two-story uh, academic sort of learning studio for architects and designers on campus at the University of Brighton. And it was built by students. And 90% of what you're looking at is, is material that was found locally, waste material, including those carpet tiles that are on the facade. And that was a diagram trying to explain um, the material that we, uh, used for the waste house. This is the building that creates 30% more energy than it consumes. Uh, it's built to sort of passive house standards and people as young as 15 were the people that built it. And those circles refer to the different materials we use, but we saved, or we, uh, yeah, we, that, that's about 55 tons of material. So that's 55 tons of material that was gonna go to incineration. And it spurned other research projects um, such as the SB and WRC project, where we were asked to find material flows, uh, waste flows, and divert those from landfill to the construction sector to, to in effect, turn waste into uh, construction materials. And we did what we call a, a, res a resource map. So this is a sort of GIS informed uh, resource map and uh, located these flows. Uh, one being, rather interestingly, right near the Brighton Waste House, which uh, was English's oyster bar, which threw away or throws away about 55 to 60,000 uh, uh, oyster shells a year. And oyster shells are the same sort of uh, material as limestone at the end of the day, calcium carbonate. And so what we did is we started looking at those oyster shells and other waste streams local to where the Waste House was. And we started making these things out of them. And at the back there, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's this fluffy stuff. We were also locating uh, uh, textile waste. And in this case, it was duvets. So we were asked to find textile waste that might um, be used for insulation. And in fact, we found a textile waste that was insulation because obviously duvets are insulation. So we started playing around with these local uh, waste materials and that's clay on the reinforced with um, feathers and uh, for, from the duvets and um, and also straw and then on the left there there are various aggregate uh, materials bound with we we did we fired some of the oyster shells to make quick lime which we were able to bind the materials with 
And ultimately, we, we made some of the tiles which were 100% oyster shells. So that, that's uh, Ben Bosons from Local Works Studio. You should check them out. Um, and uh, that tile he's holding is 100% uh, oyster shells. It's actually, ultimately, it's a concrete tile. But um, it, it's, uh, its aggregates were oyster shells broken up, and uh, the quicklime part of it was oyster shells fired. The ones that are a bit pink have got... Uh, other building waste materials in them. And this is a real project that we're involved with in Walthamstow uh, in East London, where a client's building housing. They've deconstructed the buildings that were on site, which were light industrial units. They've reused that material in the construction of the houses. And then this image on the left, um, that is one of uh, my clients sent me a photograph from his mobile phone. This is an image of hand-thrown um, bricks that were made on site out of the excess spoil from the site that they they didn't they didn't want to pay for getting rid of. So uh, they actually uh, made these bricks, which they're not load bearing, but they're suitable for internal walls, and they'll be used on their next project. We attracted another research project, which was uh, uh, snappily entitled Facilitating the Circulation of Reclaimed Building Elements in Northwestern Europe. And that's led by uh, some heroes of mine called Rota, who are based in uh, Brussels, and more about them in, in a minute. But they're all, we're already producing guides on, basically the research project is going to quantify uh, case studies, over 1,500 uh, suppliers around six countries in Europe who are dealing with the deconstruction of buildings rather than the demolition of buildings. And then crucially dealing with the reuse of that material in new projects. And just recently, the first two weeks of August, we had the School of Reconstruction, which was um, uh, a digital school, unfortunately, but that was considering the potentials of uh, material reuse uh, in the construction sector. And we had 11 teams. Uh, we have about um, 85 students and, uh, those are the team leaders, including that's Rota down at the bottom right. So that was amazing. We, we've got a whole pile of information and um, lovely work that we, we're hopefully going to uh, publish from that. So this is Rota, and this is what they do to buildings. So you read these slides from top ref, uh, left to bottom right. So they're literally unpacking buildings that normally just got pushed over. Um, oh, before we get to Lendiger, Ro. What Rota are interesting because they were uh, artists, designers, and curators of exhibitions. And the first time I heard of them was in 2010 because they curated the um, Belgian uh, pavilion at the Venice Biennale. And they then curated a retrospective of um, uh, Rem Coolhouse and OMA's work at the Barbican in London. Uh, but now they're purely, they don't do design work at all now, they purely facilitate the deconstruction of buildings for uh, other design teams. And they also, they have the warehouses and the digital platform to uh, store and distribute this material as well. And at the moment, they're working on uh, the World Trade Center in, in Brussels. There's a couple of buildings there, typical buildings that get, um, that get um, uh, pushed over after <laughs> only 18, 19, 20 years of of life. So Lendiger rather famously now uh, getting angle grinders to 19, uh, yeah, mid 19th, uh, so 20th century buildings that um, uh, you, where you can't get a sort of crop of bricks off these brick buildings because the, the mortar is, cement based mortar is stronger than the bricks itself. But here they're getting an angle grinder to it and cutting those buildings up into panels. And then there you got, there was four or five, sorry, three or four different buildings there cut up and they create the panels for this new housing scheme. This is sort of going backwards, really. Uh, in a way, a bit dull, but really actually interesting, is um, Cleveland Steel, who deal with recycled and secondhand steel um, in the uh, north part of England. Um, they needed a new building, and they found one in, um, in Dublin. And it had a BIM model, uh, and here it is, the 3D model. So they thought, oh, we know exactly what that building is. So let's try deconstructing it and bring it over to England and rebuild it here. And they did. And unfortunately, the BIM, BIM model wasn't quite accurate. Um, some of the uh, beams weren't as they should be. And by the time it's 
landed in the UK that because of site, the site situations, they had to tweak it a bit. So they sort of mucked about with this existing frame, deconstructed and re- re- erected it. But despite all that faff, I mean, it's not a pretty building or architecturally interesting, but for a project that where the budget was five million, they actually saved a million by doing that. So my point is deconstructing buildings and reassembling them or reusing their components ought to be a cost saving because your client is not buying new material. And here we got a, a nice commercial version of the same thing. So this is a recent project by uh, Arab for lend lease and British land. And this is in, you know, it's in the city of London. And uh, typically in these financial districts, these are the parts of the world where we're super consumers. The buildings get fitted out temporarily when they're brand new for, to attract uh, tenants. Those tenants say, yeah, we'll have three floors of that building and immediately rip out that interior that's only two months old and put in their own uh, branding on it. Then uh, those buildings get ripped out every five to seven years, for they get upgraded. And then ultimately, they only live about 20 years because then they're pulled down because they're totally out of style. Now, what happened here is that that 19-year-old building uh, the facade was carefully deconstructed, cleaned up, uh, the glazing bars up, upgraded and re- reinstalled. And that informed, if you can see the stats down the right hand side there, an approach to this building, which is in the commercial sector with commercial clients uh, wanting to uh, do the best they can. Now, what's interesting is because the building was only 20 years old, the supply chain for that building, the original building, still existed. So the the company that supplied the facade in the first place were prepared to guarantee the reinstallation, so the deconstruction, cleaning up, and reinstallation of their system on that building. And that's the big deal, getting uh, getting the guarantees of performance for these secondhand materials. But it's being done in the commercial way now. Uh, I just want to show you the sort of things that we're doing. We're architects and circular economy consultants for other architects. And I'll whiz through this really quickly. Um, looking at my clock, I've got, oh, been going for about half an hour. So I've got some other case studies to show you, but um, I'll just show you this. So when we're d- work- working on different sites, we're trying to do ascertain the sort of assets that are on the site uh, and adjacent to it. So this is a site actually where I live in a, a, in East Sussex in a, in a town called Lewis. And that, the orange plot right in the middle there is where right in the centre of town is an industrial site, which is, is going to be, uh, uh, they're going to build housing and other, um, other uh, buildings there, um, schools, medical centres, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what we're doing here is ascertaining what's around it. So this is site analysis, but it's to do with the potential of the site to provide resources for the client as well as for the communities. And this is a more practical thing. This is the buildings, the existing buildings on the site. And we did an audit of the buildings and ascertained what buildings were adapt, uh, just needed renovating, what buildings needed uh, more work than that, so they needed perhaps deconstructing uh, and uh, becoming a material source for the for the site, or or um, what buildings needed um, uh, recycling. So sort of you know they were beyond deconstruction. So um, that's an audit of some of the materials there. And I know I don't have the next slide that we did, but we also audited the amount of. Um, aggregates, tarmac, bricks, concrete that were the ground plane of the site already. Um, so 17 hectares and uh, you have 17 hectares of all these aggregates and materials that normal developers would just scrape up, throw away and then import more than it, more of the same. Oh, sorry, I've got it. There it is. <laughs> anyway, but we also do this, like I said, this resource mapping. So it's not only material resources, but we look at what's on site, then what's within the fire, uh, a two and a half mile radius and a five mile radius and on until we find what we need. And so this was human resources, networks, community uh, networks, social networks uh, that that needed to be nurtured and could provide the right sort of uh, ingredients for a good project. Um, and this is us testing the local supply chain. So the local supply chain might be uh, managed woodlands, uh, in this case, also, we've got a lot of ash dieback uh, in the southeast of England at the moment. So 
Well, we're running around Sussex chasing after lorries that just chopped chop down uh, massive ash trees because all that's happening to them is they're being shredded and uh, sent for, uh, to be burnt in a power station somewhere. But here we're looking for materials on site nearby, factories nearby where we've got, we've got um, quite a lot of brickworks nearby. So there we can use conventional bricks for the local, but also uh, at the at Chaley brick, uh, Brickyard, which is just to the north of our site there, we have overfired bricks and underfired bricks that normally get thrown away. We can reuse those. Um, and there's all sorts there. And then we, we got this idea for something called a remanufacturing. It's a bit like rotors facilities. So this will be one of the buildings on site, an existing building, which is light industrial buildings, luckily. And initially, it'd be the place that deals with the deconstructed building materials, as well as the recycled materials we're going to use. And then ultimately, where um, if we use um, off-site construction, modular uh, construction methods, it could be the factory where things are made, but, but highlighting and promoting the use of the local materials, local labor. Ultimately, it's gonna transform into the, a remanufactory for Lewis and the region. So once the uh, building um, project has finished on site, uh, this building can provide a facility for the region. Because not many people know what remanufactories are or what the circular economy is, it's also going to be a place where we test uh, materials and systems and you know teach these these skills. So ultimately, it's a, a creative hub uh, for the community and a resource. And this is us just deconstructing digitally uh, an existing building on site, understanding what what the components are, pulling them apart, and then speculating on. Uh, put them back together again, but on top of another building uh, to create a different sort of place, but out of material from site. And all this sort of work is going to require a different way of, a different sensibility in a way of understanding the role of the architect and designer. This is one of my favorite projects from this year's Pritzker Prize winners, which is Lacaton of Asile. Um, and I've mentioned them all uh, already, but um, this is a, on the left there as an existing residential tower in the middle of Paris. Uh, it was due for demolition and uh, Lacaton and Vassal went to the mayor of Paris and said, we can give you your new tower because they knew that they were just gonna build another one. Um, there it is on the right, uh, but we can give it to you for two thirds of the price, we, the money you've set aside. So they'd set aside 40, uh, 45 million euros for, for a new tower. And so this is what they actually did. They literally just took the facade off the tower and bolted on a new, what we might call winter garden. So this is the existing apartment. It's got a concrete facade. They unbolted that facade, there it is. And then they bolted on this double layered, double uh, built, uh, new bit of building extending the existing apartment. So you basically got a layer of sliding glaze, double glaze units with internal blinds to reduce glare. Then you've got an unheated space and then another layer of the same. And then to stop uh, excessive summer uh, heat, you've got a balcony, solid balcony. You bolt that onto the apartment and you transform it. And there are these uh, winter gardens being bolted on. And this is the before and after. So before you had you got cold in the winter, too hot in the summer, couldn't ventilate properly, had to keep light bulbs on even during the day. The aftershock, and by the way, they didn't decorate the apartments at all. They just removed the cladding and bolted these things on. Afterwards, you've got this uh, environmental buffer zone, you might call it, where you can have as much or as little light as you want ventilation the same, natural ventilation. And because of the light, natural light levels, you're not turning light bulbs on during the day. And the net result is that this create, this is like a, an unheated buffer that wraps the uh, uh, tower block and reduces their energy consumption for numerous reasons. And these are flats for people who aren't working, you know, they're retired. And uh, yeah, and what was the, when was the last renovation project you looked at where people ended up with a 12 square meters of, of extra floor space for nothing. And this is a similar project we're doing in Brighton. So there's six, Bright, Brighton's uh, land and sea locked. It's got 
15,000 families on a wait, uh, housing waiting list. It's got a shortage of housing. And here are some uh, three uh, six-story buildings, seven-story buildings, uh, where the foundations are only working at 42% um, capacity. So we're able to just about double the height of the towers, uh, connect them with community facilities. We're doing that at the ground and further up. But the new stuff is doing a lot of work for the site. So basically we're doubling the amount of accommodation on site, but we're reducing the carbon footprint on site by two thirds. So all of this is very well, but we do need information and data to make this work. So how do you quantify the resource potential of your say urban or even rural site? And it picks, it picks up nicely with concepts of smart cities. So I'm just going to dwell on the sort of digital tools and databases that are emerging and out there that allow us to practice architecture in a lot more circular and environmentally positive way. So this is something called a harvest map. And SuperUse, who are, are pioneers with this, this is this, this actual harvest map is um, from two, 2013, you know, it's eight years old. And this is the Netherlands, part of the Netherlands. This is the you know, Holland part of the Netherlands. And um, this shows you where there are materials that you could pick up. So literally spare materials uh, going. So this is what they, they call their harvest map. And they do their own harvest maps for their own projects. So they find a site, this is a site of theirs. And then as I was saying, we do, because we've copied this practice. Um, they look at what's on site nearby, what resources are around, and they can start with Google Earth. And then they use those resources to create buildings. And what they did here is they found a factory that made uh, wind turbines, uh, also a landfill site full of wind turbine blades because they don't last that long and they're massive. And they started with those wind turbine blades and then found a client that might use them. And uh, they make really uh, nice playgrounds. This is a, a redundant building in another super used project, a redundant building on an airfield. And um, it was due to be demolished, but they found a client that was willing to occupy it as uh, offices. And uh, more interestingly, weren't willing, willing to let super use reuse materials on site and do their harvest map uh, technique to find other materials nearby, which included these unlikely uh, UPVC windows, there were apparently a thousand of these being taken out of a, a housing scheme nearby. Um, so they uh, they used a number of them, not that many actually, but they found a company that was willing to clean these old windows up um, and um, revamp them, and then they installed them into back into this wind, uh, building. So this is the other thing when you're really looking at resource flows. You know, if you think of cities, they just receive so many resources whether it's water, energy, people, materials, food. And there are people now mapping these flows and super use of one of them. So they can just say, right, there's thousands of these UPVC windows being stripped out at the moment. Next, next week, it might be something different. But so the market for these materials is ever changing. But here we've got um, a building that's, uh, you know, is, is a, a low energy uh, office building as well, but it's made out of materials that were other people would be throwing away. Now, this is really interesting. Check out Metabolic. Again, they're based in the Netherlands, but they are um, a large, relatively large consultancy that map, digitally map and quantify the flows of stuff in and out, in and out of different of cities. And I know they're working on some cities in the UK as well. And this is a 3D resource map of the greater me metropolitan district of Amsterdam. Um, and it's literally an, an interactive map that would tell you the resources you've got on site. So if you're build, if you're constructing something on one of these sites to say where my cursor is, this is information is telling you the potential of that site to give you uh, material resources for your project. You can. This is a, a Revit bolt-on. This is uh, Dr. Elma uh, Demisevic of Four D Architects, and she's got a, um, a Revit bolt-on that is a three D cert. Um, surveying, uh, well, she does a 3D survey of the building, and then this survey uh, is able to ascertain the quality of the material, the type of material and, and the modularity of it, and then in effect, digitally unpack that building so you can see the resource you've got. 
And people are taking this seriously. So uh, the major infrastructure resource optimization group, MIROG, produced this white paper in, at the end of 2019, which presented our government with a case for a resource exchange mechanism. We need the digital platforms. So um, you know, if you can imagine in, a, in the city of London, while one tower has been uh, is going, it's being demolished at the moment, and another one's going up. They're not talking to each other. These digital resource map could be that you know, the one that's being deconstructed instead of demolished could be a, res a, res a resource for the one being built next door or across the other side of the country, wherever. But we need something like eBay or Amazon for the construction sector, and it may be those platforms that do it eventually. Um, I mentioned that already. So that was actually just to remind myself that reuse is the big, big deal. You guys are the sort of, uh, you know, you're, you're going to create buildings out of stuff that's already been mined and processed. Uh, and so it's, I'm not asking you to go and deconstruct every building that you see. You know, if the building's in a good state of repair, you're adapting it. Uh, you might even leave it alone. It might be all right as it is. But um, think of... Um, this idea of closing all conventional mines. Why send people down mines uh, for materials that are where we've already got plenty of them above ground? And the idea is to mine the Anthropocene. So that's a, a phrase I came up with um, uh, when I wrote my book. And I'm very pleased to say it's uh, other people are using it. So that's brilliant. Um, but basically, the Anthropocene is the human-made layer of stuff that wraps the planet at the moment. So I think it is actually about to be officially adopted as the geological epoch that we're in. My point of view is there are statistics out there like there's more copper above ground than below. I don't know how we know that, but that's apparently a statistic. And if you think about the amount of raw uh, and uh, rare uh, earth metals, et cetera, that are being mined at the moment, and then within two years, they're thrown away, it's this madness. We need to stop throwing stuff away, and we need to collect up that stuff and reuse it uh, um, perpetually. And that relieves the burden on the natural world to provide us with these resources. And that allows us to nurture the, na uh, the natural world. What's the time? I'll give you three or four new, uh, more minutes and then I'll get questions. So the circular economy, I'll just touch show, talk to you about this project of ours. It's a little, very little, small project, but the reason those two spheres come back is because it's a project that mixes uh, organic materials with waste in organic materials. So this is uh, Glymorn Opera House in Sussex. It's uh, one of the most famous opera houses in the world. People helicopter in there to see um, uh, operas. And uh, so it facilitates a high carbon lifestyle. It is low carbon itself, though. You can just see it's got a massive wind turbine that creates more electricity for the site than it needs, so that's good. But the person in charge of it um, is actually very... I mean, he's inherited the, uh, the opera house of his father, uh, and he runs it. And before that, he was a, 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 he was a wildlife uh, filmmaker. So he's got the natural world in, in mind, and he got the uh, wind turbine there. But we were asked to create a building on site, which was as environmentally friendly as possible. So we did one of these resource maps and we found this pallet of materials, unfired bricks. We got oyster shells uh, from the site because uh, people eat food on site. So there's food waste on site. Got lots of, lots of ash dieback. There's lots of corks from champagne and wine bottles. We're using the corks, collecting the corks at the moment and collecting the glass, which we use as aggregates in uh, our floors. Um, we are planning to use mycelium uh, uh, insulation, which we could grow on site. Uh, mycelium uh, is the root system for uh, uh, funguses, for mushrooms. And there's a lot of work being done in the development of these products to be a replacement for the plastic products uh, in our life as much as possible. We've also, because we're on the South Downs, we've got lots of lovely chalk and chalk can be used uh, for round chalk walls, or you can fire it to make uh, quick lime for mortar and things like that, and plasters. So the, the strategy was to collect waste from the uh, from site, from uh, uh, like I said, from the uh, canteen and other sources on site. Then have a look at what's on site itself, and it was loads, by the way. Even a pile of chalk uh, that was from uh, when they did the foundations from the wind turbine. So all sorts of materials on site. And then we found this stuff. So while we were designing the building, 
I keep mentioning Lash Dieback, but there it is on the on the right. There is such beautiful timber sometimes. Uh, it's a lot of small section ash being chopped down, which isn't much use. Um, but uh, some large section ash is being chopped down at the moment, and 400 trees on the Glyndebourne estate were chopped down, and we salvaged them for the structure of the building. So there it is on the right, being dried. Um, these are the bottles we're collecting. We're breaking them up for aggregates for for the uh, screeds and tiles. This is the clay from below where the building is, and that's um, we've fired some of that, and it's we're going to make some tiles out of that as well. Uh, that's over five bricks on uh, the left. And in this case, we are breaking those up for aggregates for screeds. And these are samples of the, we're going to do some external tiles um, with glass and brick aggregates in it. Um, those are all sorts of samples of the materials that we'll be using. So this is the world of, on the whole of recycling. And that's mycelium insulation. So that's about to get the British Board of Agriculture certificate. And that's what you need if you, Every every material and component on a, on a building that um, in the UK, you need a, a BBA certificate, and that proves that it's okay for the built environment. Um, and my, Biome, who produce mycelium insulation, um, are about to get their BBA certificate for this. Now, the amazing thing about this mycelium insulation is that it's it's um, it's got a really good fire rating. It doesn't burn. It's got good moisture. Uh, resistance but if you bung it in the ground it will be gone in three months it's part of the biosphere uh we're also uh they're maybe using um uh grass cuttings this is grass cuttings turned into lampshades and that's an exploded axe we did of the pavilion isolating where the materials are that we're going to be using that's the pavilion in situ so it's a modest building with, with our, our idea is that some um, rich people will go and use it. I mean, it's also an education facility. So they actually, Glyme will do a lot of outreach work with local schools, et cetera. But there's a story behind pretty much all the materials on there. So it's a bit like a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a local waste version of uh, um, an organic waste version of the waste house. So if you want to know, if you ask questions, there's a, interesting stories and so some of those rich rich people especially the ones that arrive by helicopter may be interested to know that sort of waste from their visit can create a building so my point is we actually know what to do so what's stopping you stop treating sustainability as a mickey mouse issue and that ref reverts sorry, refers to the triple bottom line, which is environmental, social, and economic. It's always the economic argument that's the strongest, and you end up with a Mickey Mouse uh, silhouette. Um, but we need it, yeah. We need the environmental issues and the social issues to match the economic uh, or over overshadow the economic arguments. And don't forget that architecture can matter, and it's very important and impactful on people's lives. And this is... Um, this is a housing uh, scheme um, in Vienna from 1920s. That was how uh, the Karl Markshof, that building provided 1,300 flats for homeless people. It also provided a forest school. It was, go and have a look at it if you don't know, <laughs> it's amazing. Forest school, dentists, doctors, shops, the, the whole lot for people who had none of that. So our biggest challenge is not changing the way we exist today. Thank you. Keep safe. Keep well. Thank you very much, Duncan, for this incredibly rich talk that covered so much diverse work that um, through your 25 years has really culminated to something that can really touch education practice and throughout. And I really appreciate that. Um, I was one of the very lucky people to um, get a place at the School of Reconstruction over summer. Oh, was you cancellation. were there. I was the one at the Barbican. Who oh, was oh of course you were. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing at the Barbican? <laughs> it was a period of um, living between accommodation. That and was so cool, <laughs> though, being at the Barbican, <laughs> one of my favourite places. <laughs> I, was, I was looking at the um, uh, uh, W Collective, sorry, Park W. Um, yeah. exhibition 
Oh, and well done. That was yeah. what I was thinking of the day. Um, I will accept some questions now from the audience, but um, I prepared some, if you don't mind. Um, again, I do uh, remember that you did say you need to go at 2.15. But um, my first question, uh, personally from my experience yeah. from the School of Reconstruction, I'd like to first share with the audience that it was an amazing experience that was every day had a lecture, a keynote, also some broadcast from the Waste House, which gave such a multifaceted kind of um, bite-size way of consuming all this information that you so kindly put into one big presentation as well. Um, I really encourage everybody to do their own research and look into all these amazing precedents that Duncan just mentioned. But um, from your perspective, from all the work that culminated in those two weeks, a very intense two weeks of um, a very rich exchange between um, very uh, varied uh, points of view, um, a lot looking at the um, closed loop systems. Um, what do you imagine kind of the outcome to be and also the role that the summer school plays within education and climate changes um, integration into the course? Yeah. Okay. I, what was amazing is get for me, it was going to be a physical summer, uh, summer school last year, as I said, uh, and actually Brighton Hope City Council were prepared to pay a demolition company uh, to deconstruct a building that was up for demolition and to have that deconstructed material placed in a, they had a, a, a school that was empty, but was sort of uh, empty for a couple of years. So we were going to use that school uh, to have this material stacked up and then we'd have teams of students reappraising that material. So it was going to be a very physical thing. To turn it into a digital thing was, I was like, oh gosh, how are we going to make this interesting? Um, however, what we had, what we were able to do, because once it's digital, it's worldwide. So we were able to have students from South America to China and everything in between. So that was incredibly exciting the, the the energy that the students brought was amazing so the, there is a reality that if you're if you're able to do a couple a two week summer school um you're probably doing you, you're probably not having to retake a module or two that you've failed in uh, in your own uh, your own school so uh, there was a there was a lot of ability in, in uh, from you know all the students taking part a lot of energy uh, I mean, we learned so much from the students then, in addition, I was able to populate that with team leaders again, pretty much from all over the world. So I was able to pick, like, a, you know, a, the most amazing people. Now, what that taught me about um, moving forward is that the digital stuff can be inspiring, and the digital platform inspiring, uh, and to not let go of that. I mean, I'm desperate for face to face um experiences you know um, teaching and learning experiences and uh, we will be doing that but getting groups of big groups of people together at the moment is difficult so now on, on campus anyway but i just think that we've got a we what we can learn from that is that i think a sort of hybrid mixed way going forward is probably valid we mustn't drop the digital the ability for me just even to be talking to you today when i've got something else to, in five minutes you know if you said to me can you come to cardiff to do a it would have been not no <laughs> i can't at the moment so it's, this this is fantastic but we've got to not exhaust ourselves one other thing is that we we did capture the outcomes from that two, two week summer school and um when we've got a moment because i've gone straight into another research project now we will be publishing and we will be writing to all students in the next week or so and all team leaders saying, right, this is amazing lump of stuff. We've got to we've got to we've got to publish that. But um, it was great to just have the conversation extended. So often the way it's it works is that it's it's me or a panel speaking to some students or, or whoever. And uh, for the summer school, the conversation was a lot broader and a lot yeah, a lot more people taking part. So it was intensive, but a lot, a lot was discussed. So I learned a lot from it. So to conclude, I hope we do it again next year. And maybe you could run it. <laughs> we appear to have two questions. <laughs> um, yes, we do. Um, Ever Charlton has wrote about, um, first she comments that she's from 
Lewis and Glyndebourne has worked in Glyndebourne. Oh, it's Glyndebourne, um, yeah. Glyndebourne, sorry. That's all right. Um, and um, who's this? Ethra Charlton. It says on the name. Oh. Hutchinson. Hutchinson. Um, thank you very much for attending, also, um, and your, for your question. Um, she was wondering what would be your advice for students like her that tried to campaign within the School of Architecture um, to champion climate literacy? Yeah. Uh, keep, I, I, I just Again, came up kind of your... like your position name um, and oh, apologies. Am, am, I, am I? I can hear you. Yeah, I thought okay. you, I was um, going to answer that. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so answering that question, um, you're going to see Scott this evening. Yeah, Scott McCauley. Yeah, press record and listen. I just think he's he's amazing. I'm bringing him in to ask. Scott. I tell you what, I, it's amazing how uh, we've got a new head of school at our School of Architecture in Brighton. It's now the School of Architecture, Technology and Engineering. It's a bigger school suddenly. Our new dean, we've got an away day thing next week and we've got an agenda of things to talk about. It's digital. Is the climate emergency on it? Uh, uh, uh. And I just said, excuse me, <laughs> we're weeks away from COP26. And we're talking about everything but. So the, I think the reality is you just hate, keep having to mention it. Uh, what's encouraging is that your, you know, the, the RIBA, the ARB uh, are all over it. Um, and, um, you know, there's um, events for students, practitioners and everybody over the next few weeks and months that the RIBA are hosting and other organisations. So I would join ACAN, I would uh, Architects Climate Action Network, there's a student arm of that. ACAN have got so much energy and now, so they're always putting on events that are really interesting. Um, so I would join them. I would get active. I would take Scott seriously. And I wouldn't put up with climate illiteracy, bottom line. If, you know, if, um, if your uh, uh, tutor's telling you that they do concrete buildings, that's what they do, don't do it. You know, we should not be putting concrete above the ground if we can avoid it. I can't avoid it always. Now I've got a I've got a, a building that I didn't show you there, which was um, using the materials that uh, a similar array of materials to Glyndebourne, and then the client says they want a basement. So it's like, well, okay, we dig in the ground, get rid of a pile of chalk, and, for, and create retaining walls out of concrete. You know, it's just like, oh, we don't want to do that. So it's very difficult to. Um, uh, you know, to 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 keep on message, and I, you know, I say that someone that's banging on about it all the time. So yeah, you've got to get radical. I mean, you know, we've had that's why I showed uh, Insulate Britain the campaigns what it should be. They're taking direct action. We're at that stage now where um, it is a climate emergency. We've only got a little while to do something about it for humans. Um, so we've got to be radical. So don't put up with it. Um, if if you have more time, there's two more questions in yeah. the question and answer section. Um, someone anonymous has written, um, would you say that university practices should take advantage and encourage circular research? Um, the opinion is that some feel it drives away from the focus of creative architectural design and maybe even clients' desires. That's a good question. Um, I... I think with regard to the circular economy, the challenge is to uh, design your, you know, that make the construction, sorry, the design, construction, occupation and deconstruction of your building or city, whatever it is, uh, as closed loop systems. I, if, I don't know if that is design, you know, to be able to do that, that is completely design, uh, a design exercise. So you might have to learn new things and people have been doing it in a linear way will have to learn new things. So they might not want to do that. But the point is, if you do do that, you know, you've got these other opportunities. Um, you do require a slightly diff a different sensibility, but the, I think the days of just knocking over what's in your way and throwing it away and then building whatever you want because you're so clever are gone. We can't exist like that. You know, we and to be honest, we haven't existed like that for that long up until the... Uh, end of the 19th century um you know most buildings were material stores for the future they had to be because we didn't have we couldn't get hold of many resources and it's only the second half of the 20th century and into the 21st century where we've been able to consume at an ever increasing exponential rate and we you know we, we're going to be extinct if we carry on doing that so uh 
you just got, they've got to step up. Yeah, the, the challenge is they've got to make beautiful environments, uh, but in a different way. Um, we, we touched upon this on a panel that we organized earlier this year about uh, climate literacy and creative, um, was it freedom that we phrased yeah. it as? Um, and we emphasize the role that creativity can play within the um, new uh, conditions and circumstances where we have the challenge of integrating a full closed loop system or at least yeah. more options and uh, presenting them to the client earlier. Um, one last question. Um, we have one here that says, how do we bring material testing and production to smaller communities without the facilities or resources to do so? Maybe a, a, one of the projects that you mentioned before could... Yeah, I, I, I didn't mention it, but it's a good question. I mean, all the um, what, I, what I've been able to do is mix research with practice, and it's a great way of doing it at the moment. When you're, in effect, a bit of a... You are uh, an early adopter, as I am. Um, yeah, you, you're trying, and we, you know, we, we're a relatively small practice, so we've got small projects on the whole. Sort of trying to do what I'm doing, talking about, and small projects is quite difficult. But the way I've done it is by having research projects in parallel. So having the waste house as a sort of it's been around for seven years now as a sort of ongoing test project labor live laboratory that attracts research funding and it, I, it can test the things that i need tested for my real projects however i would say that there are these things happening now um, around the world around well, around europe and in the uk so it, it's attracting um the supply chain so um for example and you know, that's why i showed the number one triton square project because that's a commercial building for you know one of the biggest uh, commercial developers, uh, uh, British land, and uh, they're doing it. So they can see the they can see uh, the benefits of um, mining the Anthropocene. So two more questions, or um, I think yes, one more has popped up um, from Casper. It says, "Do you think big corporate companies uh, such as Amazon or Microsoft?" Will truly adopt the circular economy and some of the more cutting edge progress as a template for their infrastructure. Um, they seem to focus on the tick box ambitions or renewable power generation over all else. Or, or going to Mars. Um, yeah, I I think that you I I just uh, I don't think they will. I think they'll do whatever they think can make the most money. So, but that doesn't mean that within that they have they have the digital apparatus that we need to do to service the circular economy. Um, but we could, you know, hope maybe there'll be investment in a, a sort of parallel version of something like Amazon for the construction sector. Um, I can I mean I know that large large building contractors like McAlpines and people like that, Wilmot Dixon, whoever, they do swap materials from their own sites from site to site. And I reckon they're on the verge of doing it uh, amongst themselves. So the big the big players, as it were, swapping excess materials, because they have huge quantities of excess materials, um, even, even at the moment when the supply chain is, um, is challenged. So um, I think maybe they'll do it themselves, but you know, it might, it, what will happen is it, it become a, I think it will become a commonplace within the construction sector and then yeah, ultimately, you can sell anything on Amazon, can't you? So why wouldn't you sell a secondhand uh, facade off a building? Maybe they wouldn't even know about it in a way. It would just be, you know, a new market, a new source of materials for them. So I don't know if they have to change what they do to make to facilitate what we need them to do. And maybe because I took such a long time to answer that question, you can tell that it's a very good question. I had to think about it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Casper, for that question. Um, there's a thank you in the chat. Um, thank you very much again, Duncan. I really, really appreciate um, giving us the time and your patience to do the process. That's okay. um, um, I encourage everybody to check out um, Duncan's bio, it's, which is in the description. And please look up any of the work that you've mentioned before today. And on the stories, we'll be sharing some of the links and tagging some of the companies you've mentioned. So please keep an eye out and do a meticulous search because it's incredible work. Um, and also uh, get the book out of the library. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Thank you very much again. That's Duncan. okay. All right I'll... then. Goodbye. Thank See you. See you soon. See you again. Keep in touch. Bye then. Will do. Thank you, everybody. Um, join us again for the 6 p.m. talk by Scott McCauley and then the panel discussion and the launch of WSA CAN and the closing ceremony as well. <laughs>